the topic of the letter to the Colossians is your identity in Christ. Who you are in Christ. Before you got saved, you were somebody else. You were someone in the world. You were someone without hope, without the Savior. But now that you're in Christ, you are, the Bible says, a new creature. Everything is new. And so Paul explains to the believers at Colossae their position in Christ in order to protect them from false teachings and to encourage them to spiritual maturity. All right, so we've already completed the first part of the book that talks about your position in Christ. That was chapters 1 and 2. Now today we're getting into chapter 3. It's talking about spiritual maturity. So, based on our position in Christ, how should we be living? That's what we're going to find out in chapters 3 and 4. Life in light of eternity. Life in light of eternity. Do you sometimes live out your day as if this life is all that there is? Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you think, all right, all that matters today is I get my half hour of Minecraft, and all that matters today is I get the, uh, the most pancakes, and that uh, everyone plays the games that I want to play. Well, if this life was all that there is, maybe those would be good goals for the day. But for a Christian, this life isn't all that there is. Um, there's a life after this one. It's called eternity, when we will live with Jesus forever. And that's the life that we're preparing for. That's the life we want to be ready for. And so we live right now in light of eternity. We live right now thinking about how today is going to affect all of eternity. Which means your rewards. Will you be praised when you stand before the Lord or will you be ashamed? Will you be happy to see Him or you'll be afraid to see Him? Because you haven't been living right. We have to live life in light of eternity. Well, how do we do that? How, how can we live life in light of eternity? Well, first of all, you live in light of eternity when you remember that you are risen with Christ. You are risen with Christ. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 of Colossians, chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So first of all, risen with Christ, it says we set our affection on things above. The things that are above. It's interesting that I, I picked out this illustration before I knew that we were going to watch the silver chair at our house the other day. But in, in C.S. Lewis's book, The Silver Chair, you remember they ended up under the earth. They fell down into this hole trying to escape the giants. And then they were captured by the earthmen. And taken to this castle. And all of this was underground. Deep underground. It was dark. And it was just rocks. And very little light. Well they end up in the, in this, uh, in the, in the palace. Of this evil queen. And, they, and she is trying to. She is trying to convince them. With her magic. That everything they remember. About the overworld. With the sun and the grass. And the light. That that doesn't exist. That the only world that exists is her world. That's, that's dark and dreary and, and, uh, and wet. Well, that's, that's exactly what, what Satan wants for us, actually. 
Satan wants us to forget all about the fact that one day we'll live in heaven, that Jesus is our Savior, that we'll have treasure in heaven if we live for Him. He wants us to forget all of that and just to live like what we see and what we can know right here, that's all that there is. But we have to be setting our affection on things that are above. We're living for something much greater than getting our half hour of Minecraft or, or getting the biggest piece of cake after dinner. Now we're living for things much greater than that, aren't we? We want to be pleasing to Jesus so that when we, when we meet Him in heaven, He'll be able to reward us in His kingdom. But yes, the things of the earth, they, they tend to take our attention because, well, we can't see Jesus, we can't see God, but we can see candy, we can taste it, and we can, uh, you know, we can, we can go to a party and experience the party. And the spiritual things seem so far away. They seem so far away. But as Christians, we have to, we have to remember that the things that we can't see, those are the most important things and the most real things, even more real than the things that we can touch and experience. Let's read verse 3. It says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. For ye are dead. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting. Paul is trying to encourage them to live the Christian life, and he says, you're dead. Well, that doesn't, that wouldn't get me very excited. But what is he trying to say? He says that we are dead with Christ. We are dead with Christ, and that's a good thing. How is that a good thing, to be dead with Christ? Seems like we already talked about this earlier in this letter, didn't we? How is this such a good thing? Well, we are dead with Christ. It means that we are dead to sin. We don't have to serve sin anymore. When the book of Romans chapter 6, it talks a lot about this. That if you are buried with Christ in death, then you don't have to serve sin anymore. You are free from that evil master. The evil master that says you have to do selfish things and you have to live for yourself and you have to hurt other people to get what you want. We don't have to serve him anymore. We're dead to sin. Now we have a good master and his name is Jesus Christ. Let's read verse 4. It says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now he mentions the, the return of Christ, Christ's second coming. It says, When Christ will appear, we're going to appear with him too. We'll be standing before him to be judged by him. You know, this, this kind of remem reminds me of my dad. Well, to you, he's granddad. It reminds me of him because he, uh, he discovered this book written by a man named Dave Ramsey, who's, who's always talking about how to have financial success, how to get out of debt. And Dave Ramsey says, he says, don't live for just today. Don't, don't, uh, don't waste your money. Go to McDonald's. And, and go to restaurants and, and go into debt on your credit card. He says, don't do that. Don't just live for today. Think about the long term. You want to get out of debt. And so save money as much as you can. Live as cheaply as you can so that you can put all the extra money you have into paying off those debts so you can be free of it. And then one day, when you don't have any debt, you can start building up wealth. Well, my father was very inspired by that because he had, he had some debt. Well, for the main thing he had was his, uh, his home loan. He wanted to get the home paid off. And so there was a period of maybe two or three years where every time I called up my dad, he was telling me about Dave Ramsey. And he was telling me how he's following the, the I think they have seven baby steps of financial freedom. And that he was only eating beans and rice and at home and 
and that he wasn't driving anywhere to save gas money. And his car is old and he wants a new car, but he's not going to buy a new car because he knows that buying a new car is, is a bad financial decision if you're trying to get out of debt. It puts you into more debt. And every time I called him, he was talking, telling me the latest about what he is doing to, to get that, the home loan paid off and that he was able to, to put some extra money into it this month and it's going to get paid off earlier. He was, he was living his life thinking about the future. He was living his life. He was going without for now. Maybe not, not getting all the things that he wants right now so that someday he can get what he really wants and to get the house paid off. And well, I guess it's, it's a success story too because he did get his house paid off. And he's very happy about that. Well, as Christians, it's the same idea. We're not living for just today. Maybe today you had a bad day. Maybe today you had a fight with your brother or sister. Or maybe today you got in trouble with mommy again. Maybe no one came over to see you. Or maybe someone did come over to see you, but you didn't want to see them. Maybe you just had a bad day. Well, what if you have a bad day? Is, is that so important? Well, it's not so important when you think about that what we're really living for is that day when we see Jesus up in heaven. That's what we're really living for. We're not living just for today. And if today doesn't go like you wanted it to, that's all right. Because what really matters is that day when you see Jesus in heaven. We live differently because we are awaiting the return of Christ. So how do we live in light of eternity? Well, first of all, remember that you are risen with Christ. You have a whole new life now. Secondly, living in light of eternity means that we're going to put off some things. We're going to put off some things. Now, in the rest of the, in the, rest of the sermon this morning, the rest of the passage, Paul is using an illustration that everyone can understand. He's talking about taking some clothes off and putting different clothes on. He's talking about changing your clothes. And I know that uh, whenever you're going to go, when you get up in the morning, what do you have on? The clothes you slept in, your pajamas maybe? Yeah. Um, are those the kind of clothes you should go to school in? No. What do you need to do? Yeah, you've got to change your clothes. You have to put your school uniform on because that's what you're supposed to wear at school. So Paul is telling us that very thing. He's telling us that, hey, there's some things you need to take off and then there's some things you need to put on. So first of all, let's talk about the things you have to put off. Some evil desires need to be put off. Let's read verses 5 through 7. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For, th for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. What kind of things do we need to put off? Well, first of all, he, he, he has some pretty, some pretty nasty ones. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. All right, these are, these are pretty heavy things for, for the people I have in front of me this morning. These are pretty heavy things, but probably we should mention them because we're all going to face uh, these temptations at one time or another. I know I was very disappointed uh, this past week. I saw, I saw on the internet that there was a, a very popular Christian comedian on, on YouTube. He's, he's, he's very funny. Lots of people watch his stuff. That he was found out to have been having uh, bad relationships with lots of different girls, lots of different women as he traveled around and as he met people. 
He was, he was uh, using them. And he was, a, he was a young man, apparently not married, but he was trying to act like he was married with all these different women and girls. And he got into big trouble. Finally, it was found out that he was this kind of a person, nasty person, and that he couldn't stop himself. And now his being a Christian comedian, especially, you can't get away with that because Christians are expecting that you act like a Christian. And he certainly was not. But we, need to, we have to put those things away. Those things will destroy you. They will destroy you. What, at, the, at, at your ages, probably the only thing you would face is maybe the other boys at school will show you a dirty picture of a woman who's not, not dressed. That's how it starts. They want, you to, they want you to look at something like that. That's how it starts. That's how you get an appetite for these kinds of things. You have to, the first time they do that, you say, no, I don't want to look at that. And they can call you gay. They can say whatever they want to say. It doesn't matter. Because more important is that we stay away from that. And don't, don't get involved. Well, what else does he talk about? There's other things too. Um, there's evil concupiscence. All right. Does anyone know what evil concupiscence means? All right, this is an old word. <laughs> concupiscence apparently means a, an evil desire. So you look at the Estonian, kori himo. It's, a, it's an evil desire, an evil lust in your heart for something. All right, this is, this is a much broader um, meaning than those words up above, fornication, uncleanness. This is a much broader meaning. Um, all kinds of fleshly desires that you could have. You could have a desire for drinking, um, for eating too much. You just can't stop eating snacks and eating things that are bad for you. Well, some people have a real problem with that. And the Bible says it's not right. You could have a, a problem with being lazy. You know, you just, you just want to be lazy and you just, you just want to lay around all the time. You don't want to work because that feels good to just lay in bed a little longer. The Bible says that's not right. Everything that, that wastes our time, you know. Some of, us have, some of us have temptations with computer games, with watching uh, television programs, watching too much YouTube or too much time on Facebook. You know, those are things that we like. We really like them. And we can end up wasting a lot of time on that. This could be evil concupiscence, evil desires that oh, I just, I'm going to do it because I want to do it. And I have the right to do it. And so you do too much. Don't be a slave to these kinds of sins. Uh, if, you, if you have a real problem with some of these things, well, that's what, that's what your pastor's for. You can, you can come to me and we can work together, uh, if this is a real problem in your life, to get victory over these things. Well, what else? He says covetousness. Covetousness. Um, desiring things that don't belong to you. Or desiring things that uh, where you're never satisfied. You always want more. You always want more. This is called covetousness in the Bible. You're, you're never satisfied with what you have. Um, your fleshly desires, they just, they control you. And you always want something more. Always have to have more. If you have two of something, then you want three. And if you have three, then you want to get four. There's never enough. And the Bible says, very interesting in the verse... It says that this is the same as idolatry. It says covetousness, which is idolatry. Um, why, why is it idolatry? Well, probably because when you have something in your life that's so important that it, it, it takes over your, um, your loyalty 
to itself. That more important than serving God is that I get to do this thing that I want so bad. Well, if it's already to that point, then the Bible says covetousness is idolatry. You have put this thing above serving God. Now it's more important. Not that you're going to the local temple to, to uh, burn incense to Athena, the goddess on the Acropolis. No, it's, it can be as simple as, um, as uh, instead of doing your Bible reading in the morning, you're spending extra time on Facebook, keeping up with everything and putting likes and posting pictures of yourself looking kind of cool. That is idolatry. When it becomes more important than serving God, we have to be very careful. These are things that we have to put off. Put off. Just like our, our pajamas in the morning, we put them off so that we can get dressed. And then we have sins that are directed at others. There's some nasty sins as well. Let's look at verse 8. But now put ye also off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. So we have anger, wrath, and malice. It means that you're thinking evil upon other people. Uh, if you're angry, if you have wrath, if you have... Well, the Bible says malice, like an evil desire for somebody. You want to do harm to them. You want things to go badly for them. You want to get even with them. The Bible says, put those things off. Put those things off. You don't need to get even with them. You don't need to get back at them. You don't need to strike at them. And then we have blasphemy and evil communication. These are attacking Words. These are, uh, these are evil words directed at other people. In the Bible, the word blasphemy is not just against God. Sometimes it's talking about our relationships with other people. That we are going to uh, try to offend them with our words. Try to get them angry with our words. Well, I see this all the time. I see this all the time with kids. Especially brothers and sisters. You know what bothers them. You know, you know what makes them upset if you want them to be upset. You're, you're mad at them and you think, ah, I know what gets Abby mad. Everyone thinks Abby's so sweet, but I know how to get her mad. If I say this, then she'll be upset. And so you say it and it works. Well, this is what he's talking about. Blasphemy, filthy communication. Uh... What else does he say? He says lying. Something else we need to get rid of. Verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Okay, or at least you should have put off the old man with his deeds. And lying is included. I think we all understand what lying is. And we don't tell the truth. Um, and lying, look, it gets its own verse. It gets a whole verse to itself. Number 9. Um, the other ones are in a list, but lying, Paul says, oh, okay, we need to focus on this one. We'll give it its own little, little sentence here. Put off lying with the old man and his deeds. Do we have trouble telling the truth? Well, sometimes we do. And God knows that we have trouble telling the truth sometimes. Uh, we want to defend ourselves. We want others to think well of us. We don't want to look so bad. Yeah, maybe, you, maybe that is how it happened. But that makes you look really bad. And you're not really that bad of a person. So you're going to lie so that they think a little bit better of you. Yeah. Or you're getting in trouble with your teacher. She's asking questions. And you don't want to answer the questions. Because you know that it's, you're going to be punished for that. And so you think of... Well, maybe I'll tell her this instead of what she really wants to know. And you come up with some kind of a lie. Yeah, it's tempting, isn't it? Or even adults at work, 
yeah, the boss is asking you questions, and you think, uh, I can't answer that. I can't answer that question. Uh, I'll be in trouble. Uh, so I need to tell him what he wants to hear. I'll tell him that it happened differently than it actually did. Yeah, we have trouble with that sometimes. But we need to, we need to take that off, put it away. Put it away like our morning pajamas and, and get dressed. All right, so enough of what we have to put off. Now let's talk about what to put on. If we are going to be living in light of eternity, there's some things we need to put on. Because so far, we've just taken our jammies off. Well, we can't go to school like this. Uh, we need to put something on, don't we? All right, quickly, this, let's figure out what we can put on. Um, verse number 12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. What is he saying here? He says, live according to your position in Christ. What, in the very first verses of this letter, he said that the Colossians, they are holy, holy and unblameable, I believe it was, uh, before God. He calls them saints in the very beginning. Well, it doesn't mean that the Colossians always did everything right every moment of the day because they're saints. No, it means because they are forgiven, because they are in Christ, that before God, when He sees them, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ instead of them. And in God's eyes, they are completely clean and holy. Well, Paul says, okay, since that's true, we need to live that way. We need to live like the holy people that God knows us to be. We need to, we need to behave uh, correctly. God has already um, declared us to be holy, righteous, and clean. So let's, lead, let's live a holy, righteous, and clean life then. Uh, Compassion, kindness, humbleness. Which of these things that he mentions, which of these things are missing in your life? Um, he says, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering. Are, are some of these things missing in your life? Well, put them on. Put them on. And then he continues. He says, forgiveness. Forgiveness, verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. There are constantly coming up situations in your life where you need to forgive somebody. It's happening all the time. And in every one of these New Testament letters, forgiveness is mentioned and discussed because we need it. We constantly need it. But we have a great advantage as Christians when we need to forgive someone because we know why we should forgive others. We know why. Now someone outside, someone who's not a Christian, you say, you need to forgive that person. Yep, they took advantage of you and they did something evil to you, but you need to forgive them. Well, the person out there that doesn't know Jesus to say, well, why? Why should I? It'd be better for me if I don't forgive them. Well, you can try to explain to them why. But you don't, have, you don't have the real reason why like we do. Why do we forgive someone? Because we have been forgiven by God. If we have been forgiven by God of all of our sin that we ever have done or will do, we don't really have the right. It doesn't make sense that we would hold something against somebody else. One or two little things. No, as awful as they might be, we don't have the right to hold something against them because God has forgiven us of absolutely everything. So we have a big advantage 
when it is time to forgive. And those times will come. Those times will come and continue to come. Verse 14, what else? And above all these things, put on charity. That's another word for love. Put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. All right, everything that we do should be done with love. Love is when you do something for the benefit of somebody else. Not for your own benefit. And not in your own interest. Uh, maybe, maybe today you go to the store with your friend and, and you, you buy some candy and you share it with them. And then maybe tomorrow you go to the store and your friend buys candy. But then they don't share it with you. Now, that's not love if you say to your friend, Hey, I shared with you yesterday. You have to share with me now. That's not love, is it? Love is that, okay, they won't share with me, but that doesn't mean that next time I still won't share with them. Now that's love. You share with them next time, even though they haven't ever shared with you. That's love. Acting in the benefit for them, that they can enjoy the candy with you, not so that they'll do something for you next time. Peace. In verse 15, the first part says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Alright, so we've got to put on the love. We've got to put on the peace too. We have peace with God. Uh, this week I found a news story that just a, just a few days ago, there was a pastor in Nigeria. Um, his name is Lawan Andimi. I'm probably not saying it right. But Pastor Andimi, he was a pastor in Nigeria in a village that was attacked by a, a terrorist, terrorist organization. And they were Islamic. And he was missing after that day. And then they found out that the pastor had been taken by the terrorist. And they were demanding a lot of money to get him released. And as these, as these terrorists often do with the people that they capture, they make them do videos pleading with, other, with their friends and relatives to, to uh, collect the money, however many thousands or millions of dollars, to get them free. And for one thing, to show that the person really is alive, they haven't killed him. And another thing, so that they'll feel bad for their friend or their father or their relative and, and help him be free. Well, in his video, the title of the article that I found was that the pastor uses the video opportunity to give the gospel. And apparently, as he knew his video would be shared with, with many, many people and seen he uh, shared the gospel in his video and talked a lot about God. And you imagine he's being filmed and next to him are, are these Islamic terrorists with masks over their faces and uh, maybe some kind of assault rifles in their hands. Uh, and he's going to talk about Jesus Christ. I bet they weren't happy about that. He said, among other things, he said, I've never been discouraged on his video. Because all conditions that one finds himself in is the hand of God. Sounds like he had peace while he was there uh, being held under these weapons and being forced uh, to stay with them. He also said, don't, don't cry, don't worry, but thank God for everything. He had some kind of a supernatural peace in his heart. That only God can give. How else, how else could you have peace like that? You know, I recently read uh, another story about a similar thing. Except uh, this man was a journalist. American journalist taken by the pirates. And he didn't believe in God. And he did not have peace in his heart. <laughs> you, read, you read the things that he went through. He hated his captors. Um, he thought about killing them. Uh, he... Uh, he tried to escape, and, and he was just completely miserable um, with his captors. He had no peace. And yet this pastor, probably in a much worse situation than this American was, 
because this man was African. Um, he had peace in his heart. He said, thank God for everything, even for the fact that I'm a hostage by these terrorists. Peace in your heart. Put on peace. We should be able to have peace in any situation. And then we have thanks. The next part of the verse says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye also are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Be ye thankful. You know, this same, this same pastor who was taken by the terrorist, he said that we should be thankful, that we should thank God for everything. How can he say that? Well, he had learned how to be thankful. Probably what he was meaning is that in his hostage situation, he was thankful that he was still alive. He was thankful that the terrorists were feeding him. Um, he was thankful that in this video that he could, he could say words of encouragement to uh, thousands of people who otherwise wouldn't even know his name. And yet he has this great opportunity as a hostage. Be thankful for everything. Well, unfortunately, this pastor was killed uh, last week. And, but he leaves with us this great legacy now. How we can put on peace. How we can put on uh, thanksgiving in any, any kind of a situation. And he had peace with God and he was thankful to God right up until the last moments of his life. Isn't that amazing? Well, it shouldn't be that surprising because that's how Christians should be all the time. And then we get to verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Fill yourself with the Bible's teachings. Uh, Jesus said himself, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What you've filled yourself up with, that's what you end up talking about. Um, I know when, I know when, uh, when Ryland's been looking for hours at the Lego catalogs, just looking at them and looking at them. You know what he's going to talk about? He's going to talk about what he saw in the Lego catalogs. Excited about the new superhero sets and the, the new, I don't know what else he's interested in right now. All the sets in there. And the, the Ninjago or whatever. If you, if you filled yourself, your heart up with that, then that's what's going to come out. But at the same time, if we fill ourselves up with the word of Christ... That's what's going to come out. That's, what's, that's what we're going to want to talk about. That's what we're going to be thinking about. He says, fill yourself with, with the Word of God. Read the Bible. Read the Bible and listen to godly music. Well, half the verse was talking about songs, wasn't it? He says, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord... Why do, we, why do we have these songs that we sing before the service? Why do we sing them? So we can fill time and say, yeah, we sang too. Well, no, not really. When you, when you sing the songs that we sing in this church, think about the words. The words are meant to fill your mind with thoughts about God, about Jesus, about eternity. And when this song gets... When the songs get stuck in your head and at home you're singing to yourself Amazing Grace or I've got a mansion on a hilltop or whatever it is. These kinds of songs, that's what he's talking about. It's, it's constantly reminding us of the Word of God. That's one way, can, one way we can do it is with songs. What kind of music do you listen to? Are you filling your mind with different kinds of messages? Because you know, every song that every pop star writes and performs 
it has a message, doesn't it? It has a message. Now, sometimes I know uh, people listen to songs in, in, in different languages and they don't really know what the message is. But every song has a message. And if you, if you look up on the internet, find out, what is this song teaching? Should I be listening to this song? Maybe it sounds fun. What are they trying to teach me? You know, oftentimes, if not always, <laughs> these pop songs are not teaching us biblical messages. They're teaching us wrong ideas about love, wrong ideas about life and what's really important. Let's fill ourselves with the truth, with the Word of God, and with songs that are giving messages that agree with what the Word of God teaches. That's what we should fill ourselves with. All right, what else are we putting on then? Well, verse 17, we're getting to the end now. It says, And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. All right, so now Paul's trying to pull it all together. He says, okay, everything that you do, do in the name of Jesus. Uh, all, your entire life should be lived in the, in, in, the, in the name of the Lord. Everything that you do. What kind of, what kind of work do you do? I know none of you kids work, but no, Tonel works. What kind of work do you do? You can, you can do that work in the name of the Lord. Uh, driving the bus. You can do that in Jesus' name. You know, serving others. Taking them from one part of the city to the other. And it doesn't matter really what, what work we do. I mean, we have people that come here with do IT work and, and, uh, and you know, having Airbnb, whatever it is. Whatever it is that you do, you can do that in the name of the Lord. You're serving others. You're sharing Jesus with people that you have opportunity to share Jesus with. Everything that you do should be done in the name of the Lord. If you're, if you're playing with the kids at home, well, do it in the name of the Lord. You're, you're serving God by serving your children. If you're making a, a meal, if you're walking the dog, or if you're, if you're on vacation somewhere... Um, you should be serving the Lord. You should be doing that in the name of the Lord. And everything that you do on your vacation or in your free time, things that the Lord will be pleased with, things that are enriching uh, your life spiritually and in the lives of others. Even our, even our sleeping. Well, that count, sounds kind of silly. How do you sleep in the name of the Lord? Well, you need to sleep, don't you? I think if you didn't sleep, would you be able to serve God very well? Not really. You'd be tired and grumpy all the time. But if we get our sleep, if we get the sleep that we need, well, not too much. We don't want to waste our time. But not too little that we're tired and, and can't, can't do the work of God so well. In our sleep, we can be serving God. In our eating, you sit down for a meal. You thank God for the meal, and you can eat all things in the name of Jesus. You can eat in the name of Jesus. Enjoy that, 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 uh, that pork that you eat with the mashed potatoes in the name of Jesus. Why? Well, because if you didn't eat anything, well, you wouldn't live very long. It would be a short life that you lived serving the Lord. And if you, if you don't eat enough, you don't have very much energy. That's what gives you energy. So, if you're eating right, eating healthy, then you can serve God. Now, if you're eating too much, it has the opposite effect. If you're eating too much, or they're eating the wrong things, yeah, then it's harder to serve the Lord. Well, then you get sick all the time. Then you're kind of tired all the time. Then you, you, get, you get overweight, and that's hard on your body, you're kind of, and you don't feel so great. Everything we do, whatever it is, should be done in the name of the Lord. That's what we put on. We put on all these things up here. Forgiveness, love, peace, thanksgiving. Filling yourself with the teachings of the Word of God. Living in light of eternity. Yes, we're not living for today. Maybe today was a bad day. 
well, hopefully it's not been a bad day. You came to church. But maybe the rest of the day is not going to go the way you wanted. Well, what then? It's not so important because we're living in light of eternity. We're living for the day when we stand before Jesus Christ and He judges us. We want that day to be a day of joy, uh, not a day of fear and of dread because we know we haven't lived right. No, we're living in light of eternity where just like we get up in the morning, we've got to get our pajamas off. We're putting off all the things that are not fitting for Christians. And then we've got to put something on or else we don't want to walk out the door like that. We've got to put something on and what are we putting on? We're putting on the things that the Bible says to love, forgiveness, thankfulness, and the list goes on. Live life in light of eternity. 